I am Gina Louise Shara, and I will be presiding this evening. This is the March 18th Committee on Community Resources um, meeting and public forum on short-term rentals. Um, I, I just want to announce that we're being audio and video recorded. And uh, we're going to call the meeting to order and take the roll call, and then um, we will go right into the meeting. So, Laura, would you please? Councilor Shara. Here. Councilor Goodwell. That's it. Councilor Klein. Here. And Councilor Nash. Present. Um, so the first thing that we always do is public comment. If you're here to speak on the public forum, then um, no need to come up now. There'll be time during the public forum to talk on that topic. If you're here to talk, us, talk to us about any other topic, now would be the time to come forward and share with us. I'm not seeing anyone, so I'm going to move on. Um, the minutes were not ready, so we are going to um, do those next meeting. So we're going to move right into the community forum on the proposal to adopt the community impact fee on short-term rental units. Um, I am going to read the two orders quickly, they're fairly brief, and then I'm going to turn the floor over to Mayor, Mayor Narkowitz, who's here, to um, sort of explain the orders a bit and answer questions, and we will open up the, the floor to comments from you all. So I'm going to start with the first order, which is 18.234, in order to accept Mass General Law 64G3DA, to impose community impact fee on short-term rentals. Ordered that whereas, by virtue of Chapter 337 of the Acts of 2018, the legislature amended Chapter 64G of the Massachusetts General Laws by adding subsection 3DA, which allows communities that have adopted a local room occupancy excise to adopt a community impact fee not to exceed 3% of the total amount of rent for each transfer of occupancy of a professionally managed short-term rental unit that is located within the city. And whereas the city adopted a local room occupancy excise by city council vote on April 21st, 1988, and whereas it is in the best interest of the city to impose community impact fees upon the transfer of short-term rental units and professionally managed units located in the city, and to dedicate the fees to affordable housing projects within the city, and whereas the authorization contained in subsection 3DA is a local option requiring the city council to accept the provisions thereof by majority. Now, therefore, be it ordered that the city of Northampton accepts, accepts the provisions of 30, section 3DA of Mass General Law Chapter 64G and hereby imposes a 3% community impact fee on the total amount of rent for each transfer of occupancy of a professionally managed short-term rental unit that is located within the city. <coughs> All community impact fees received pursuant to this order shall be paid to the city monthly by the operator. All community impact fees received pursuant to this order shall be dedicated to affordable housing projects within the city. So that is the first order, A. And then B is 18.235, in order to accept National Law 64G, subsection 3DB, to impose community impact fee on short-term rentals within two and three family dwellings. Ordered that, whereas, by virtue of Chapter 337 of the Acts of 2018, the legislature amended Chapter 64G of the Massachusetts General Laws by adding subsection 3DB, which allows communities that have voted to impose a community impact fee upon the transfer of occupancy of a professionally managed short-term rental unit that is located within the city to impose the community impact fee upon each transfer of occupancy of a short-term rental unit that is located within a two-family or a three-family dwelling that includes the operator's primary residence. And whereas, by vote of the City Council immediately preceding this vote, the City Council voted this this um, is written as, as, as if A had already been um, accepted. Uh, voted to impose a community impact fee upon the total amount of rent for each transfer of occupancy of a freshly managed short-term rental unit and, whereas it is in the best interest of the city to impose community impact fees upon the transfer of short-term rental units located within a two or three family dwelling that includes the operator's primary residence and to dedicate such fees to affordable housing projects within the city. Whereas the authorization contained in subsection 3DB is a local option requiring the city council to accept the provisions thereof by majority vote and now therefore be it ordered that, this, that the city of Northampton accepts the provisions of section 3DB of Mass General Law 
Chapter 64G, and hereby imposes a 3% community impact fee on the total amount of rent for each transfer of occupancy of a professionally managed unit that is located within the city. All community impact fees received pursuant to this order shall be paid to the city monthly by the operator. All community impact fees received pursuant to this order shall be dedicated to affordable housing projects within the city. Thank you for indulging me while I read those. And uh, Mayor Narcos, if you would come and explain those a bit for us, maybe um, talk about some of the terms that are in there as well. Certainly, yes. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much, uh, counselors, and thank you to members of the public that are here. Um, just by way of background, um, some of you may know that um, in the final, literally the final days of the uh, last legislative session, um, there was a compromise reached uh, between the governor and the legislature on a, a short-term rental bill, uh, which basically, you know, people use the shorthand Airbnb, but basically a short-term rental bill. Um, that would basically uh, close the loophole that had existed prior to that in Mass General Law Chapter 64G, which, which governs, um, up to that point, had governed all different types of lodging uh, and, and rental, uh, not rental, but lodging, and, um, and added short-term rentals to that. Um, it imposed a number of things um, which are beyond the scope of the city council that's been accepted you know, by the legislature. Um, the two local option aspects to the law um, were first of all the local option um, excise on, on hotel and motels, which the city of Northampton accepted back in 1988, as you read from the, um, as you read from the order, um, would be uh, automatically uh, folded into uh, short-term rental. So if any city or town that had accepted that statute automatically accepted them for the um, for short-term rental. So that's again the the um, uh, state excise tax and then there's a local uh, uh, fee as well um, that we've been collecting on hotel rooms um, since again since it was adopted back in the late 80s. The other provision of the law um, the other local option, uh, which means that it's not, it's an opt-in provision, is this community impact fee. Um, and the legislature spent a great deal of time uh, talking about this, hearing um, from folks on, on both sides of the issue, and particularly hearing from um, folks that were concerned about uh, the impact of Airbnb on housing affordability, on rental availability, and, um, and some of the research that's been done about it. I think I, I posted and sent out um, back when I first introduced this, a really good um, article by City Lab, which kind of looked at this issue um, and looked at some of the research uh, that had been done on it, including here in Massachusetts. Um, I just would quickly cite uh, just a couple of paragraphs for that. Um, since Airbnb helps homeowners take existing housing stock and turn some of it into short-term units, its, its biggest measured effect so far has been on housing prices. By repurposing units that might otherwise be long-term housing, it's straining an already supply-short market. Rents rise in the process. Uh, the city's researchers have, analy have analyzed happen to be already pricey coastal metros, meaning Airbnb is just one of the many factors at play but researchers say it's a powerful one. Um, I was surprised at how early in the process of Airbnb expanding into cities that had measurable impacts on housing costs, and that's uh, citing uh, one of the researchers. In Boston, one working paper from UMass um, found a causal relationship between Airbnb proliferation and housing prices. With every 12 Air Airbnb listing for census tract, asking rents increased by 0.4%. Um, Findings were reinforced at the national level. Um, working paper from SSRN, which used American Community Survey data to find that with each 10% increase in Airbnb listings in the US zip code, there was a 0.42% increase in rental prices and a 0.76% uh, increase in house prices. Um, up at McGill University, um, uh, folks up there in their urban planning department uh, found that in New York City, Airbnb was associated with a 1.4% increase in uh, rents between 2015 and 2017. So the concern, again, we, um, 
we understand and recognize that this is a new sharing economy and that people, um, it's creating a new um, income stream for some people and it's also um, providing a, a new type of, of lodging, short-term lodging. Um, but the, the state law also recognizes that there are, can be um, negative impacts of that as well. Uh, most notably, the impact it can have on rents um, uh, and, and impact on just the availability of rental units. So what the law envisioned is, um, is sort of a two-part community impact fee that, um, that communities could adopt. Um, and it's on a very narrow category of short-term rental. So just uh, first of all, to define what a short-term rental is, this is what the state law defines. It's an owner-occupied, tenant-occupied, or non-owner-occupied property, including but not limited to an apartment, a house, a cottage, a condominium, or a furnished accommodation that is not a hotel, motel, lodging house, or bed and breakfast establishment where at least one room or unit is rented to an occupant or sub-occupant and all accommodations are reserved in advance, uh, provided, however, that a private owner-occupied property shall be considered a single unit if leased or rented as such. So that is how the legislature defined short-term rentals, or STRs, as they're called. Um, so what, what the two subsections of the law uh, are, and you've, you've read uh, the order that would accept uh, Section 3DA, um, and then you read the language for Section 3DB, and there was that awkward language that said that, you know, and, and whereas the city council has accepted A, well, there's a method there's, to that madness because the legislature says you can't even consider B if you haven't accepted A, so you have to have affirmatively accepted A. So basically what, um, what Section A says, and I even did a little diagram because it's hard to kind of, um, just for myself to, to uh, remember, um, it talks about if you are um, if you are a uh, if you are if you are renting or transferring occupancy of a professionally managed unit that is the term that they use and of course there's a definition so a professionally managed unit is one of two or more so that's key you have to have you have to be uh, doing two or more to trigger this. Um, and they have to be STRs or short-term rentals that are located in the same city or town, so two or more in the same city or town, um, operated by the same operator. So you know you're you're an op you're an S short-term rental operator, and you've got two units in the same in the same community or more, um, and they are not located within a single. Uh, one, two, or three family dwelling that includes the operator's primary residence. So an owner-occupied, you know, uh, one, two, or three family house would not fall within the purview of this subsection. Um, and so what it's saying is that if we accept that, then if you are um, operating two or more professionally managed units um, in the city, that on those transactions, you would pay a 3% uh, community impact fee uh, to the, directly to the city or town, um, and that, that that impact fee would be put into, what I, as I'm proposing it, would go into a uh, special reserved fund, it would be a, a, a receipts reserved fund um, that would be put towards affordable housing, um, advancing affordable housing projects in the city of Northampton. Um, again, going back to the earlier policy rationale, uh, the, the um, trying to mitigate possible impacts on affordability. Um, and as you know, uh, the city has um, used um, resources like the Community Preservation Act funds, um, I've, I've applied uh, federal CDBG funds to support affordable housing um, and maintaining a, a, an adequate stock of affordable housing. This would be another uh, set of funds that I would have to come to the city council to appropriate and it could only be used for affordable housing projects. So that's, that's the first uh, subsection. Then um, uh, subsection B or 3DB um, has that basic construct, um, but what it does is it eliminates the owner 
occupied exemption for two family and three family. So you see I crossed out two family and three family. Um, so basically what it says is um, that, so if, if both of these subsections are adopted, then basically what the, what the community mitigation fee would be on would be on um, professionally managed units, again, it's that two or more in the same city is the professionally managed unit definition. Um, and it would not apply to an owner-occupied one-family home. Um, that, would be the, um, that would be the distinction. Um, and again, to be clear, if you are just have one home in the city and you're doing Airbnb out of that home or you're renting a back bedroom or a spare room or whatever, none of this applies to you. It would not apply to you um, because you'd have to have, you'd have to have two or more units. So in the first example, if you had a three-family home, for example, um, and you were living in one of the units, um, and uh, it wouldn't matter because you'd be that unit would be exempt from consideration because it's owner occupied. So it would be exempt from from um, being considered as a unit that would fall under this. That's what the um, that's what three A says. Three B gets a little stricter and says only if you're living in a one family um, where there's an Airbnb or, or a short-term rental occurring, would you be exempt? Um, so again, if you live, so if the council adopts all of these sections, if you were living in a three family home in the city um, or a three unit home, um, you were living in one unit and instead of renting one or more of the other two units, you decided you were just going to short-term rental the other two units, or Airbnb the other two units, um, then you would be subject to the community impact fee on those two units. Um, and again, uh, those would be two rental units that would be taken out of our long-term rental stock. Um, that's the public policy goal um, in terms of why the legislature imposed uh, the potential for this community impact fee. So um, that's the basic background on what it would do. Um, you obviously, the council, you know, follows um, the issue of housing affordability in the city. We're in the middle of a major fair access to housing uh, study right now uh, where we're looking at various uh, barriers and hurdles. Um, and obviously one of the things we also hear um, about Northampton is the fact that yes, we are this very attractive uh, place that people want to live, they want to work, they want to come here. Um, we have a strong uh, local economy. Um, what that has done though, of course, is it has driven up housing costs and in some cases made it more challenging for people uh, to be able to afford to live here, you know, particularly for workforce um, and affordable housing. So that's the backdrop by which I bring this forward. The legislature only requires that up to 35% of the fee be, de be strictly dedicated uh, to either affordable housing or infrastructure, I'm proposing that 100% of the fee collected um, be, uh, you know, be applied. People have asked me, do you know how, how much this would be, how many it would be? Um, a lot of this is, is, um, is a little unclear uh, because one of the things the law also does is it will require everyone who is, is operating a short-term rental to register that unit with the Department of Revenue. Um, and the Department of Revenue will have a, a basically a registry that will be available. Um, and even if you, the law does exempt the first 14 days from the excise, from the, from the sales tax, the state sales tax, but even if you don't plan to rent more than 14 days, you still have to file a declaration with the Department of Revenue and say, I intend to operate a short-term rental or an Airbnb, um, you then can file a declaration of exemption saying, I don't intend to go <coughs> over uh, the 14-day uh, threshold. Um, but, uh, but so um, I can't, uh, and, and obviously one of the issues with Airbnb generally is there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of information, specific information on where each unit is located in the city, what type of housing, who the owner is. Um, so these questions about who are multi-owner uh, properties or who, you know, how many people own multiple properties, where are they located, what are the types of home, 
are they a single or two family or three family? We don't have that data right now. Um, that would be part of the implementation of the law, which does not go into effect until July 1st of 2019. Um, so that's the quick overview. I can uh, try to answer questions. I know people have lots of other questions about the Airbnb law generally. Um, I can try to answer those. There is lots of um, info online. DOR has a great, uh, is starting to populate a page about frequently asked questions about the law. Um, and, uh, and, there are, and there are numerous uh, private organizations, realtor organizations, uh, rental associations, condo associations. Everyone's putting together information on the law um, to, uh, to be able to let people understand it more. Final piece in terms of the collection, um, again, it's the law envisions that it will be collected at the local level on a monthly basis. Uh, we are waiting for DOR uh, to provide us with the action, uh, a little bit more detail on their regulations. I know they're going to be developing regulations and guidance on that, um, but that's how it would be um, how it would be tabulated. So what the reporting piece will be in terms of how DOR and or the platform, the short-term rental platform, will report that information. That is yet to be worked out. All I can tell you is that the impact fee is to be collected locally on a monthly basis, and it's paid directly to the community, and it would go right into that receipt reserve for affordable housing uh, fund. Thank you. Um, Council Member Fuller, I open it up. Do you have any clarifying questions or anything you want to ask? That? Yeah, just a few quick ones. It, you know, it finally came to me that, <coughs> that this is describing the opposite of the way I think. So, the, um, so if I own a home, it, you know, a single family home, and I want to Airbnb it, you know, move out for a week or so, I, 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 I'm, I'm not going to be subject to the fee. That's correct. Right. And so if I... Um, if you own a home... And then you buy a second home right. for the purpose of then then you then that one is subject to some the of these things depending on which sections. And the same if I own a three-family, that my primary residence is is not subject to the fee, but if the other two um, uh, units would be subject if I'm doing short-term rental. If you're doing if you were to turn the other two units into just short-term rental, so essentially you were sort of running a mini hotel of sorts out of your three-bed three three-unit three and so the question I had, and maybe you don't know the answer to this, mm -hmm. is that what determines when, um, <coughs> what's owner, what is it, owner, um, my primary residence, you owner know, occupied, yeah. owner occupied, it how long do I have to live there, can I be, say I'm owner occupied, is, is, there, is that defined somewhere? Uh, that uh, let me let me look that up when I have a second here. I don't know that they've um, that they've given like a set. Because uh, I, I admit, you know, I imagine, you know, if I go away for a month, and now I can, you know, I rent it out for a month, I'm still owner occupied. Yeah. But if I go, I don't know. Let me um, let me look in the definition okay. section. Okay. But I, that sure was just something I was curious. They may have still spelled that out. So between questions, I can um, I can look for that. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm assuming the legislature spelled out what that meant, um, or at least put some time parameters around it. But I can um, I can look that up while we're. They seem to have thought about it from every other angle. No, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Thanks. I have a question about the collection piece because when I um, read on the DOR website, and it's been a couple of months already. <coughs> They were talking about the collection being done by them, and it would then be filtered back to the local that's area. The, Has that changed? No, that's for the tax. That's for the that's for the local option uh, uh, occupancy tax, which is different than the impact fee. Okay. So that would be collected just like um, um, meals taxes, just like marijuana tax, the local option marijuana tax. It would be collected at point of sale, um, and then eventually DOR would transfer those funds back to us. Um, so, that, that, but the the um, community impact fee, which is not a tax, it would be collected locally. So, 
Um, I'm going to start, some people signed up um, to speak, so I'm going to start with them and then I'll make sure that everyone who wants to speak gets an opportunity. So first is Craig Delapena. Excuse me as I hobble up here. I just had a full new replacement a few weeks ago. Congratulations. I've been looking forward to this for years. Years. <coughs> I know well, B and I, I think are the last real bed and breakfast operators in the city of Northampton. I've been doing this since 2003. And then we've seen the phenomenon of Airbnb come in. And I was a member of Airbnb, or I'm not sure if a member is the correct term, but they fired me after a while. Because I'm not a guy who likes to give money to 3,000 mile away organizations. And that's what you have to do, and you have to be hidden. You cannot be a member of the Chamber of Commerce or anything local. I sent you all a little copy, two pager. The second page is mostly about Airbnb. The first page is about how I became an air, uh, a bed and breakfast operator. And it's been very much fun. We've met people from all over the United States. As a realtor, I'll get between five and nine transactions a year. From people who come here and love this place so much they want to relocate here. It's my perfect marketing circle. And you can be assured that none of my money leaves to go 3,000 miles away. Companies, national companies of any realm you can think of that are here, whether in restaurants or whatever realm you can think of, they survive, but they don't thrive. The same thing is with Airbnbs. Airbnbs are hidden. They cannot be a member of the chamber, a local tourism entity, I would love, there, I know that the, I know there's, there's over a hundred Airbnbs within the confines of Northampton. Mm -hmm. I would love for them to become part of the chamber indirectly. I know that's expensive. Um, we are members of the chamber. Um, I'm also on the Hampshire County Regional Tourism Board. And Airbnbs are not allowed to be there. We only like local things. And Airbnbs, if they were to become known, and believe me, once DOR has their information, they will become known and no longer hidden in any way you can actually imagine they're hidden. So I would love to see them become part of a Northampton Bed and Breakfast Association. Wouldn't that be great? to have a centralized calendar, a room availability for people who come here and see that this place is not sprawled out like a piece of junk other places or broken other places. You have completely functioning village center locations with preserved farmland just outside. That is not seen in a lot of places, yet we take it for granted to such a degree we don't even notice it. But the guests who come here, they see it. And it is one of the reasons why this place is so special. So, everything the mayor talked about tonight, I was kind of disappointed. No questions asked about what, what is a professionally managed place? We haven't heard that answer. And, and everything we've heard tonight doesn't impact me, except that I'm gonna be paying a tax now because I'm being folded into the hotels, three or fewer rooms on bed and breakfast never paid taxes. So now we're gonna pay the state tax, we're gonna pay the local tax, we're gonna pay probably the 3% fee, and I'm gonna be paying my CPA more. So I took my first price decrease. I'm up 20%. I don't care. I don't care a whit, a bit, not at all. I want the Airbnbs folded into something local and <coughs> treasurable, rather than being sinister and hidden monies leaving town. 
I'm very, very much, I grew up in Holyoke. I live here. We're not going anywhere. We love living here. And thank you very much for holding this tonight. I've got another 7 o'clock meeting to go to, so carry on. Thank you. I'd hate for you to leave disappointed, though. Would you like Mayor Narcos to answer your question? Professionally managed. That's Yeah, I did read the definition of what professionally managed was. Um, and, uh, and then I also want to be clear that a short-term rental, by definition, can't be in a bed and breakfast establishment. So if you're a licensed bed and breakfast establishment, you cannot be a short-term rental. Well, I never called myself that. Okay. So, okay. So um, I don't know, because you are right now getting a license as a bed and breakfast, correct? I have been for yeah. years. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And you're, you... I love to have the Board of Health come to my house and take the measurements of my refrigerator in my, my uh, dishwasher. Okay. I love the have building they done department. That? Yes, they do. Yes, of course, because you're serving, you're serving breakfast. I yeah. love that, yeah. yes. So you, so again, by definition, you would, your bed and breakfast would be exempt from this law entirely. Right. So I, I should mention also, and I mentioned this in the, uh, the letter, but across the street from our legal bed and breakfast with our one foot by one and a half foot sign as required by the city, that I look across the street in a four family house and I see two Airbnb units in there. One by a woman who puts her kid through a private school who then camps at DAR State Forest every weekend in the good weather months and opens her house as an Airbnb so she can afford to put her kid in private school. How interesting and cute is that? I really, mm hats -hmm. off to her. Yeah. But her landlord, when the new landlord bought the place, he loved the idea so much that he decided to take one of his other three units out of service and make it into an Airbnb that he gets double the rent. Mm -hmm. Instead of 1500 he charges $3,000 a month rent. Yeah. So those would clearly trigger yes. the community impact fee, unlike your, unlike your bed and breakfast. Right. Um, so thanks, Dave. Yes. Thanks okay. for your heart. Yep, thanks for being here. Um, Dee Boyle Clapp. Right. Like Craig said, um, we own another one of the B&Bs. We've been in operation for 10 years. And um, my husband and I are kind of conflicted on this. We're not quite sure what we think. On the one hand, we believe in the disruptive economy. We have to recognize that everybody needs to make a living. On the other hand, this has really hurt all of us. I watched when we came here, there were five bed and breakfasts, and as soon as Airbnb came in, people started to fold out. There are numerous reasons for it, but some of it is, is fairly competition. So that's an issue that I've had. I think my other issue is really that um, the sort of the processes have been unequal and unfair. But we do run a BNB, and b and the rules that we have are nobody, nobody is allowed to cook in your house except us. And if you take rent an Airbnb, people can. People are not allowed to eat off of the same forks that we are, even though we are required by law to put our forks and all of everything else into a dishwasher that has to reach a certain temperature gauged by a certain little sticker that says it's hot, it's got hot enough. Um, Craig Nova be all of the other crazy stuff that we have to do with. Um, pets have to be out of your kitchen when people are eating, et cetera. Kind of, there's a lot of lists of things that are different, and I would love to see some of this stuff become equal. Either we're no longer required to do it, or everybody else has to sort of measure it out, because if it's safe for one, it should be safe for everybody. And at the same time, that doesn't make any sense. So my other sort of thing that I'm concerned about is, how is it Northampton going to find the Airbnbs? Aside from the good people who have the courtesy to show up today, everybody else can stay hidden. The other piece is, how do you know about Airbnb, Airbnb VRBO, glamping, all of the other billions of places that are out there? It's going to take somebody you know, a lot of time to figure out who these people are. And how is this going to be enforced? Uh, I have no idea how that's going to happen. Is there going to be a fine if somebody doesn't pay their, their monthly fees on time? How is that going to all work out? So I think there's a lot of stuff that needs to be honored out here, and some of it hasn't even been considered, I'm sure. I have one other thing to say, which is that I'm also concerned about the 3% fee that's going just solely to low-income housing. Not that I have a problem with low-income housing, and I feel that the town needs to do everything it can, but other cities, like Houston, for example, they have a special tax that I feel the Northampton should really consider, which the, a percentage of their tax goes to, to supporting the arts. That does a lot for the community. It brings in more tours and brings in more people who would actually want to use those services. So it actually might be a really good consideration as opposed to sticking with the 3%. What if 1% goes to the arts? What if it can go for Northampton uh, to help artists, to help nonprofits, to help other arts organizations? So I feel like there's a lot that needs to be done here. 
like Craig um, and like Mayor just said, this isn't going to affect me a whole heck of a lot. But I do feel like there has been so many, there have been so many people in town who haven't participated in paying taxes, haven't been paying their health insurance, health fees, et cetera. We've been sort of carrying a bit of that burden, not to mention the fact that as chamber members, we've also been advertising and helping to, you know, grow the city as much as humanly possible. And I'd love to see more of that because our city does need more support and does need more help. And in particular, I think that the downtown, you know, needs more support from the artists as well. And the artists should get paid something for the, the good work that they do. So good luck with this. I think there's a lot of, um, you know, open up a can of worms and it's just going to keep wiggling. There's a lot here. Thanks. Thank you for those comments. I just want to point out, I think actually Mayor Narkowitz did answer your first question that you um, posed, which was how people, how we would know they, who they were and how they would be registered. Everybody has to register, should be able to um, work within those, mm -hmm. you know, the, the different companies that you mentioned. They will have to register with the state for the state law. And therefore, we will then get access to those. I think it's going to be hard to get people to do it. So that's why well, they won't be able to use Airbnb. I mean, right. they, they won't be able to mm -hmm. rent through Airbnb or VRBO unless they are registered. Mm -hmm. So unless they're going to find a renegade way to advertise themselves, mm -hmm. um, they won't be able to do that. If, if I characterize that correctly. Yeah. Great. Um, who, who else would like to speak? Please. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi. Uh, I have some questions. Is this an okay time to ask them? This is a perfect time. Okay. So I'm understanding that from your definition of two or more SDRs is the first long... I'm sorry. I'm, I oh, so I'm sorry. apologize. You want, um, could you please state yeah. your name and... Yes, yes. Okay. I am Rebecca Muller. I have lived in uh, July of this coming year in Florence in the same house for 40 years. I have... Um, an old duplex that we converted to, um, we just opened it up, but we kept the two address status, and I've converted a small part of that house to be a mother-in-law apartment, which I currently rent at, uh, through, um, what is it, BBRO or whatever, occasionally. Um, I am, I do not consider myself a professional, um, what's the word, a professional, managed uh, person. I do it as part of my retirement plan with the hopes that it will pay my property taxes and water and sewer and allow me as a single person uh, to survive in this economy. Mm -hmm. Having worked in human services for a lifetime, not at giantly high pays, and if I may add for affordable housing often. <laughs> so I'm in favor of that um, usage as the, um, as the impact fee. But I just want to clarify this impact because um, obviously I try to do things above board and um, I will register um, through the DOR. And if I only have one small unit, am I not a professional? That's my first question. So you live in the home. I live in the home. And you have one unit in the home. I have my apartment, my whole house. Yeah. And then I took a small portion yeah. of it, which I probably will live in. This as wouldn't apply to you. It would not apply yeah, to me. This piece wouldn't apply to you. But um, the state the law would apply to you. Yes. Um, but this piece would not apply to you. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yes. And so. Um, now again, that, it's primarily because you're staying under the two or more threshold. That's what I wanted so, to find. So um, it can be. It is definitely the two adopt, or more STR. You can't just adopt the. You know, you, you adopt okay. this, and then this gets layered on. And so, so then, how do you define owner occupied? Um, I was look. It's funny they've got a definition for every other term, yeah. but they don't have owner. They have, they have a definition for owner. They have a definition for occupy, but not for two. Um, I, I'm, I'll need to get further clarification, but I, I suspect um, there's plenty of other existing regulations where you have to prove that you're actually living somewhere, like if okay. you're registered to vote or you're paying taxes or how you're being taxed. So I'll have to. I'll check with DOR and what their what what their guidelines will be, but I. My sense is you have to actually be residing yeah, and occupying yeah, 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 yeah. the home. Um, yeah. And there are other programs that have that criteria, so okay. um, we may need to, um, you know, including in some cases tax um, exemption on, on mortgages and such. So we, we'll, we'll, I can try to get more clarification, but I re read the law. There's not a standalone definition for owner-occupied. Now, will you start a page, a web page or something, or a place with that could 
offer clarification on all of these things for um yeah i mean we we can put up a once uh depending on how this turns out we would definitely be creating a short-term rental page on the city okay. um and i would also say that the law does allow um, the city to also enact its own local regulations, which we're looking at. We're, we're not, um, we're taking a look at them. Um, I generally don't like to add another layer if I can avoid it, but we may create, for example, a low cost registry here at the local level as well, because I'm not, I'm not so convinced how easily we'll have access to the state information, but we may create a local registry here um, as well. Um, but. But we'll, de we'll definitely try to put information up there. As I said, if you go to the Department of Revenue, Mass DOR, they have a short-term rentals page which has a whole set of frequently asked questions yeah. which goes through the law and the financial and tax implications of it. I looked at it when they first posted, but I haven't kept up with yeah, it. Yeah, they keep adding yeah. it as they okay. figure it out. Yeah. Again, this was passed um, on December 28th yeah. um, in the f by voice vote. Um, in the final waning days of the session yeah. um, and there was a disagreement between the governor and the legislature and they compromised and that's how it got into effect. Okay. It probably helped that Airbnb had also filed suit against the city of Boston a couple of months earlier about Boston's regulations which were about to go into effect. So, um, so I know that, that um, there's, there was finally consensus that we needed to do something on this. Okay, great. I think that's everything. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yes, sir, in a red sweater. So, uh, my name is David Arbeckman. Um, Rachel May Smith and I run an Airbnb on North Farms Road in Florence. And um, I just wanted to respond to some of the, the uh, diatribe of the first gentleman and say that in terms of what we collect, most of that stays in the local economy. So, Airbnb does get a cut that goes out to corporate Airbnb. <coughs> but just to be clear that most of that is income for us. We're um, you know, both over 65. And it also brings in people who go to local restaurants, go to local concerts, um, you know, go downtown, buy things. So I think it does stimulate the local economy. So I think to, you know, describe Airbnb as sinister and something that's just headquartered in San Francisco, I think does an injustice to the fact that it does help the local economy. Thank you for sharing. Yes, please. My name is uh, Joanna Campe, and I live on 152 South Street in Northampton. Um, yes, I feel like I want to defend Airbnb a little bit in terms of what I feel it does contribute, and I also do acknowledge, I think the 3% fee for affordable housing is great. I think, you know, I really would feel, you know, very happy about that. When I turned 65, I started to hear from real estate people hoping I have to sell my house. You know, so I've lived in my house since 1981, <laughs> and it means a tremendous, a lot to me to be there. Uh, one of the things I do with Airbnb is I provide a chemical-free, fragrance-free uh, place to stay, and that is very important. I mean, there are so many people who are chemically sensitive who are so happy to be able to come there because they can't take the harsh chemicals that are in most hotels. Um, <clears throat> another thing that I've noticed in the many years that I've been doing it is that um, there's a great need for medium, what I would call medium length stays in Northampton. There are lots of researchers who come to study at the library for two weeks. Uh, there are visiting professors who are there for one semester. So I kind of consider this really feeling, uh, feeling a need for Northampton because these are not people who are going to want to come and stay in a bed and breakfast or in a hotel for that length of time. They want to be able to, you know, to fix a meal. They want to, um, you know, be able to live in a comfortable surrounding for that time. Um, I have a special list of restaurants, recommendations. You know, I really feel that, it, I feel like an ambassador. And um, I did try, you know, having housemates in my house, but when you own a house, 
especially if it's a very special one, it's kind of hard to do that. On the other hand, I absolutely love hosting. I love Northampton. I love talking about Northampton. I've had people come, like the head of the uh, Goddard Space Flight Center, when, you know, for the parents of Smith, people from all over the world. I have uh, people who come from China because they tend to want to visit their children a little bit longer <laughs> at the colleges. Like if they're at Smith College, they might come and do their IT work for a month and, you know, stay at my house or whatever and do that. So it also just provides me with a very interesting back and forth culturally I feel means really a lot to me and it's what is allowing me to stay in my house at this point in time. So I just wanted to share that side of Airbnb. Thank you. I do want to just, um, the, uh, the state law does actually give a little, little help there. It says that um, occupancy in a um, bed and breakfast, hotel, lodging, house, or motel designed normally used for sleeping and living for a period of not more than 90 days. Um, and then um, short-term rentals uh, occupancy is not more than 31 days. So I think that those are some cutoffs at least that, so if, if you're, if you're somebody who's visiting professor and you're, mm -hmm. then I'm not really sure. If you're, if you're more than 31 days, then you're not really short-term renting, I guess. Yeah, well, my one, sense. Thing, one thing I wanted to say is I'm feeling more confused now looking at that, actually, than I felt before I came. I mean, just before I came, I, you know, I looked at the DOR. The one thing about the DOR, I feel like if Airbnb would just collect it all, and then, you know, send it to them, I'd be really happy. The idea that if I have a two or three day short rental, I have to fill out forms and all of that just creates a lot more bureaucracy, which I'm not looking forward to, actually less than paying the tax. Um, so I think I want to pay my fair share, but I also want to uh, say, I think this provides something really wonderful to the community, actually. and. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. But you just have one unit that you're you just you're just Airbnb in one unit. Well, I live in my house. Yep. Okay, and it's it's a it's a one family unit, I guess, according to yeah. this. I don't leave the house. No. I share the house. So you'd be exempt from this then, under under any scenario that we adopt. You'd be exempt from the community impact fee. Okay, and yeah. then pay the um, state tax. The state tax you would mm -hmm. still have to pay. Yes, that's correct. That's that applies to anyone. The governor was concerned that one of his concerns was that he thought that it would, um, for people that are just doing it occasionally, that it would be inhibited or prohibitive for them. That's why one of the compromises with the legislature was you wouldn't have to pay the tax um, if you only Airbnb or short-term rented 14 days or less in a year. So if you're just somebody that's doing it occasionally, you know, during commencement or you know whatever, it, you wouldn't have to pay the tax. Um, so I don't know how many days a year you're renting your space. I don't know whether it would trigger the tax. You still would have to register yeah. with DOI. Yeah, it would trigger the tax definitely. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So okay. I just wanted to make that. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Who would like to speak next? Mayor? Um, I prepared some slides. I'm never sure if there's going to be a laptop up here when I come Can up. Can you tell us who you are first? Uh, um, I'm Patrick Bowen. I live in Ward 5. Um, I'm on the city's housing partnership. and the first chair for that, we looked at ensuring that we stay above the 10% subsidized housing threshold. We're also looking at general affordability across the city um, for low and moderate incomes, which goes up to about 67,000-ish, depending on uh, which metrics we're using, sometimes those size and ID. Um, when this come and speak tonight, on behalf of the Housing Partnership, uh, we looked at this regulation after it was proposed by the mayor at the City Council meeting, and we support the adoption of the community impact fee. I um, wanted to speak to kind of an update of what, what the housing situation looks like in the city, particularly for affordable housing, and also why I think taking this money from the community impact being applied to affordable housing makes sense since that, that is the thing that's being impacted by short-term rentals. 
So a couple stats about what this uh, housing situation looks like in the city. Since 2013, um, home prices have increased about 33% in the city. 50% um, of renters are cost burdened, which means you're paying at least 30% of your gross income towards your housing. Um, half of that amount, so about 25% of the city, is severely cost burdened, which means you're paying 50% more of your gross income towards housing. And since I got those initial numbers two years ago, they got a little bit worse in the next year. So now it's slightly above 50% total. Uh, for owners, it's 20% are cost burdened, and half of that is severely cost burdened as well. Um, we looked at the American Community Survey data over the last five years for ha what's happening in the rental market, and it does a nice breakdown in their surveys of looking at um, what are the incomes of different people living in rentals or owners throughout the city, and what are they paying. And what we found was that over the last five years, that 600 rentals have crossed over from being 300 to $1,000 um, to be 1000 to $2,400, which are their category raises, category ranges, so that 600 years want to cross that threshold. 9% um, of rental households with incomes below 50000 left, or not, there's a 9% decrease in under 50,000, it would largely be replaced by above 75,000 or above 100,000, so it doesn't seem like everybody got the raises that went over the 50,000 threshold. It seems generally people moved out or replaced by people who have significant more income. And that 4% of households under $20,000 just left the city entirely, so that's 208 households left of the fairly low income. Um, looking at Funding for affordable housing, which is not just low income, it's low and moderate income, so it covers a pretty large amount of the city. Um, two major funding sources, the Community Preservation Act. Um, from the state, you used to have a 100% match. I think down now it's down to about 12%. Does that sound right? Yeah. So dramatically less money than there used to be. It's a very different conversation at those meetings now from when it was relatively flush. Um, before other communities sign on to now it's fairly uh, much smaller pot. But the, the bigger impact for affordable housing is uh, one of the key funders is called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. And there's also a state version that makes up about 40% of an affordable housing project. And the, the impact of the, let's see, so, the way that works is that businesses got a discount essentially on their taxes by putting money into the low, low income housing tax credit. But because their overall tax rates got dramatically reduced under the tax cut that was passed two years ago, that is now not nearly as lucrative for businesses to do, so it doesn't provide <coughs> income to affordable housing projects. And it's estimated across the state that it will decrease the amount of affordable units that get built by 200,000 from that change. Um, and then within the city, as you know, and as many of you supported and voted for, um, we built the Lumberyard Affordable Housing Project, a mixed income project down here, and also Live 155. Um, together, that's about 100 units, but since Live 155 is replacing an existing, much older site, the net of those two projects is about 60 units. And from the data I got from Airbnb, um, as of 2017, they had 150 different uh, units within the city, and 100 of those were whole, what they call whole units, either it's an entire apartment or an entire house. So in the time that it took us to build these new affordable projects, we had an equal or greater amount of short, of either owned units or rented units leave our long-term ownership or long-term renter market. So given how difficult it is to build affordable housing or the housing in general, losing units to short-term rentals can have a really big impact. Um, and as the mayor shared before, when he said that 12 Airbnbs in a census tract would increase rent by 0.4%, um, we know that in Northampton, which is not the, the whole census tract, we have at least 100 of them. <coughs> so that's part of what you're seeing in the rental increase. 
to say anything else there. Um, and the, looking at like the city's broader goals, for we talk a lot about climate change and trying to take actions to be sustainable. One of the things that we want to do is to have more people live close to work and be able to walk or bike and not, not use a car to get to work. Um, when we talk about housing more broadly, it's about building more housing closer in. But one of the things we can do is not to lose housing that we have for long-term renters and long-term owners. So I'm encouraged to see this both as perhaps lessening the proliferation of short-term units. Um, I don't think the 3% is going to dramatically change how many, how many people want to rent these types of homes, but at least we can get additional funds to help to, to help a little bit to offset our loss in affordable housing funding from the bigger players, the CP, CPA and the low income housing tax credit. And so I'm really appreciative of the mayor for bringing this forward and I'd like to ask that you recommend its adoption. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak or have any questions? Yes, please. My name is Robin Barber. I live on Vernon Street in Northampton. I was born here. And uh, my only comment about uh, Craig Delapena's speech is that Airbnb is not hidden. Like, mm -hmm. all the <coughs> listings are public. And certainly, my wife Carol and I have never made any attempt mm -hmm. to hide our participation <coughs> in Airbnb. So I was puzzled sure, by that. Sorry, could you direct your comments to us, actually? You're, we are your audience. <laughs> well, so I was puzzled by that comment because it would have been quite easy for him to take a look at the people in Northampton who open their homes. And one other comment I would make, um, our, our Airbnb <coughs> does not take a rental unit out of the rental stream because it's uh, used as an office at other times in the week. Um, and I think that's probably true of many of the rent of the 150 or so rental Airbnbs in town. Um, but he mentioned, you know, all the benefits to the city of the bed and breakfast, and I just want to agree with you that the amazing variety of people who have stayed with us um, over the four years that we've been part of the program, um, they're all here to enjoy Northampton, and we've had three buy homes after visiting us. Oh. Um, I, that I know of for sure. Um, so it just seems to me that the uh, sharing economy phenomenon, uh, while it has its problems, and while I would certainly be pleased to pay my share, um, it's part of our extremely vibrant local economy. Um, I just wanted to r remind people that I did in my opening remarks I acknowledge that I totally acknowledge that I've stayed in Airbnbs myself I, I understand that I, um, and I understand it's part of this new sharing economy um, I, and again what we're going after is just a very small sub segment of people that are professionalizing it and mm -hmm. you know in some places like San Francisco I was just reading a story by a former Northampton um, resident, um, actually Pamela Schwartz's son, who's working for a legal foundation in Hawaii. Hawaii is having all these foreign investors who are buying up apartment buildings and basically turning them into short-term rentals, and it's completely decimating um, their hotel industry. And, and so it's having all these unique effects. And you know, you can talk about Uber and Lyft and how great that is and how convenient it is and how cheap it is and how wonderful it is. But now we've got all these single occupancy vehicles um, clogging our roads. Um, and Boston has the worst traffic um, on the, in the country. 
because um, we're not investing in public. So there are some side effects that maybe weren't unanticipated. So what this is about is not to go after you who's just renting a, a bedroom out, but to go after the folks who may be creating those kinds of impacts that we want to try to mitigate a little bit. So I just wanted to just clarify my position on this. I know Craig has very <laughs> strong feelings and he's shared them with me over the years and I get that, but I just wanted to make sure you understood where I was coming from. Thank so. you. Yeah, I just wanted to make uh, one more comment based on what he said. I think maybe, I don't know, 20 percent of the people who stay with me are people who've lived in Northampton in the past and they want to move back or they're coming to see if they want to live here. And, uh, you know, when you stay in a situation like with us, we are there really sharing everything about Northampton, you know, to them. So that's a part of it, which they wouldn't experience if they stayed in a motel or something. They wouldn't have, it'd be harder to try to, you know, know what it would be like to live here. So I just wanted to. Thank you. <coughs> I see another hand over here. Now, is there anyone else who... Yes, please. Good evening. My name is Brett Constantine. My wife and I uh, live in Florence, and we have a short-term rental in our uh, two-family home. So we are taking one unit out of circulation, and that has always <coughs> bothered me to an extent. Um, since that's the only unit that we have in the short-term rental market, we won't be subject to these. And I'm kind of sad about that, in a way. Mixed feelings, I guess you could say. Um, I would be happy to sh pay my share as well. Um, and so I'm curious if this group is considering anything beyond 3DA and 3BB. Um, and I know many of the people behind me would be happy that they're exempt. And again, I have mixed feelings. But I'm curious, are you considering something beyond these? These are the mayor's orders that he's put forward. So sure. actually, the question yeah. should be directed to so the letter. So two put parts. Um, number one, this is the full extent of what we can do at the local level because okay. it's where it's we're not allowed to to impose things that we aren't authorized by the legislature. Sure. Um, point two, we do accept donations. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> we always accept donations. <laughs> Um, so if you, you know, you could write a check, you could write a check to the city and say, I want this to go into that affordable housing fund. We may. We do that. I won't so. promise that. Yes. <laughs> I'll have to talk with my wife too. But. We take Visa and MasterCard. Just, <laughs> no, but you can always, if someone felt compelled to do that, you could do that. Yes. Um, yeah, you sense. certainly could. And I understand, uh, I appreciate that. But um, yeah, there's not, we are not allowed to go any further than what the legislature authorized us to do. Thank you for clarifying that's right. Yeah, no problem. That's helpful. Yep. Um, also, maybe it's obvious to some people, I want to make sure that it was spoken. Um, as the mayor sort of talked about in his inciting studies, some short-term rentals bring in tourists and some don't. I, I don't, I want to make sure that's clear because while I'm fully supportive of the short-term rental market and I don't intend on changing what we're doing with our unit for our post personal reasons. Um, I don't have any illusions that I'm bringing Northampton lots of dollars. I don't think that's the case. Um, I think people will travel when they want to travel, and I think they'll find a place to stay. I think this has helped more people sometimes, but and find nicer places to stay. I absolutely agree. But I'm <coughs> not convinced. I have to read some studies that it's bringing in money. Um, and likewise, only some short-term rentals are taking stock out of circulation, as many folks have mentioned. Um, so I don't, I'm curious to see how much money this will even raise. H how, how many of these, you know, are even in Northampton? I, I suspect not many. But. We are also curious. Yes. <laughs> I think that's all that I have. But I, I <laughs> speaking to um, Craig's co comments about hidden versus open. It's always bothered me that Airbnb hosts can't more directly contact each other and that they aren't. That I don't mind the, the addresses being hidden. That's fine. That that's, makes sense. But I've, I've always liked the idea of a more organized group. Um, so maybe that'll come out of this. Maybe it won't. But thank you for your time. Thank you for those thoughts.
Yes, please. Hi. I'm Rachel Mason. I just wanted to follow up on one thing that Brett, is it, yeah. just said. Um, he took the initiative to put up a sign-up sheet at the back. Mm -hmm. This is for Airbnb hosts who are here so that we can actually start to communicate with each other. Because I'd like to think of us not as um, competitors, but as people who we're all trying to make a little bit of money to help out and to enjoy this wonderful experience. Um, but it's going to be really complicated for somebody like me to understand how this law is going to work in terms of insurance and cooking and all of that. So if uh, be before people leave, if you want to sign up with your, your phone number or email, um, maybe we can all start helping each other a little bit. Anybody? Yes. Um, I work in the arts, and we're also listed on Airbnb, just so people are aware. Um, there's a group that's working together right now to create what they're calling the Arts Hub, and it's going to be a new um, a new website that's going to include opportunities for people who are listed as, as um, rental places or other types of venues. So there might be something that's out there for the region. It probably won't be ready until next year. But if people are interested, I'm happy to I'll sign my name onto this list as well so that I can get the word out about this. I agree that there's more opportunities here. Again, I just want to underscore that I'm not opposed to this. We are listed on Airbnb, but it's been the ones who, it's the inequities that's always bothered me, that we have to pay so many fees and fines and get our water tested and all this other crazy stuff, and yet my next door neighbor doesn't have to do any of that same stuff. And that's just like not correct. I don't think mm -hmm. that's fair. So for that part, I, I really, it does bother me. Um, just in the inequities piece, but I don't want to take away anybody's livelihood or, um, Etc. My husband's retirement, this is his retirement job, and we built our house intentionally so that we could do a bed and breakfast so that he would have this opportunity to do the same thing. Um, I also just want to clarify, I, I know Craig, I've known him for a bunch of years. Um, he's very passionate because he has a different sort of perspective. Um, I think the piece about how Airbnb is hidden is the fact that when you go to a site, you can't tell where someone lives. You can't go, oh, that's 10 Maple Street. It's actually sort of in this big circle of something. And I believe that's what he meant by hidden. Um, he also really feels like people should just become part of the greater community in terms of the chambers. But that's what he meant. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to respond. Um, I also think that the inequity should be uh, resolved, at least to some degree. I think that mainly the B and B rules are um, far and above what is practical and far and above what helps people stay safe uh, from what from what I understand of them. So I don't know if that, that's your pur purview, but if there's a way to deal with that, to recommend some, some action on that, I would love to see that. Thank you. Yes, please. Hello, good evening. My name is uh, Andrew Faber. Technically not from Northampton, a local community here who is kind of in a similar short-term rental um, mix here. And I'm not sure if you'd be able to clarify this for me, Mayor, but they're looking to uh, prohibit multifamily homes from being short-term rentals. And I'm not I'm just curious if that's allowed. You I mean your community they're, is trying to do that? Your community is? Yes, our town. Um, so, and so I'm just curious if with the new law being passed, can they accept <coughs> you know, one and not the other. Um, it does allow you to create local, this is totally separate from local zoning regulations. Um, and so I guess theoretically you could um, craft a zoning ordinance to only allow short term rentals in certain parts of the city that and I so theoretically, I suppose they could and um, they could also possibly put use restrictions on certain types of housing. I, I don't, I'd have to see what they're proposing, okay. but I just want to see law. Yeah, you itself. can you can do zoning if you want to do zoning for short term rentals, you can just like right now we have zoning about where hotels can be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can't build a new hotel in a residential neighborhood. Um, uh, and so it, it could be that your community is looking at how to use zoning to limit where short-term rentals can take place. I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think, and I, I believe they're 
it's going to be allowed in all zones for uh, single family homes okay with uh, four bedrooms or less mm -hmm. uh, but once you hit uh, multi-family home you're prohibited from uh, you know being in a, a residential neighborhood in any yeah any, uh, throughout the town and so I feel that I don't know that just kind of that would be a question probably for their town attorney and the, and I mean you can enact zoning um, it does give it doesn't take away the city's ability to look to do local zoning mm -hmm. um, that would be a legal question um, fair enough well, yeah. I just figured you've looked into the matter I have for you know, this town you might we do. haven't looked into zo any zoning changes relative to this um, but I could see where some communities which have you know we don't we, we only have about 20 percent of our land is commercial mm -hmm. you know most of it is residential mm -hmm. and we have these unique neighborhoods that have historic commercial uses so i i don't know that it would apply as much here so i if you want to tell me the community well we're right across the line in williamsburg so uh, bergy yeah, okay bergy yeah okay mm -hmm. yeah, so they're they're yeah to, they're i certainly tomorrow. don't have any skyscraper hotels there no, no uh, skyscrapers yeah. um you know I, and i would love for them to adopt the community impact fee, yeah but um they they don't i don't know i'm not sure how how the vote will go and yeah and the legalese of uh, it'll be a town meeting warrant it's a zoning change so they'd have to bring it to the planning board and then eventually town meeting <laughs> yes. so but that would have to be approved by the attorney general in advance so if it's illegal they'll tell they'll certainly tell you it's illegal but um you know cities and towns can as long as the zoning is applied uniformly um, you, I suppose, theoretically, you could put a limit in place on yeah, the types of being discriminated against having that uh, garage apartment, you know, mm -hmm. whereas you know other folks, uh, yeah, can get away with it. But thank so, you for uh, no problem for I helping me out. You more help. You know, I, I wish I could move. Uh, you know, okay. <laughs> You're welcome here anytime. Uh, in words, so okay. <laughs> we're stuck out there. Anybody else who'd like to share or ask questions? Anyone else? Mayor Narkowitz, no. do you want to say something? No. Okay, thank you. We're gonna, we are gonna finish our business as a committee. You're welcome to stay or leave. Um, but thank you so much for coming and sharing your thoughts on this. We really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, you can you Yeah, I think it's confusing. It's very confusing. Some of the other Yeah. I think we're probably more likely to have to take your conversation outside. We're just trying to finish up our meeting, but thank you so much. We're going to have people who have like two or three short term goals again. And one more step we have the phenomenon that's happening in Boston. We'll just have to let you know exactly what we're going I was trying to think of how to explain it, and so I just I thought I'd make a little grill. Okay. Enough that. 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 Enough I'm still a little confused. Yeah. Alright, so if I, if I have what's called a I love what you're doing, and I love how we're expanding the sharing economy. If you just bring it outside, that would be awesome. Thank you. We're just, we're on camera, and we're trying to wrap up this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. 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 Yeah. So we, we heard about different yeah. situations. Okay, so like a mother-in-law <coughs> apartment in one family. In one family would not be subject to that. Okay, and also if I had um, a, a 
I think there was a gentleman mentioned, you know, it's an office most of the week, and then on the weekends they turn it into a, that becomes a rental unit. But well, it doesn't. Yeah, but it doesn't trigger this unless you've got more of that. So, it, so they actually aren't separate units. No. Got it. Yeah, I mean, because by definition, how could you know, one, if you if I mean, they settle one family home. So right. it would be, I don't think they envision, an, an owner-occupied one-family home. So I don't envision that you're living, you're homeless and yes. rent your house out. So um, if you have an office with a Murphy bed, right. you Airbnb it, um, that's not going to trigger this. You're still going to be subject to all the other regulations. Right. You're still going to have the insurance requirements and all the other pieces of it. But if you're just taking your office off the, I mean, it's not on the rental market, right? I mean, it's not a rental unit. It so if it's two STRs, sorry, am I interrupting, yeah, it will, interrupting yeah. your question? You're probably going the same place. Anyway, and it's, go ahead. it's a one family and they have three be bedrooms that they rent out, then that does, that will trigger it because it's above the two? Or, or I think it's in a one family home, which is a very clear classification right. under under you know zoning and under assessor codes and things like that. So um, I suppose if you you decided I'm gonna rent the office and the back bedroom or something, um, then you're getting into again, I, I don't that'll be a question for how they make you register them. Like and if you're in a single family home whether they're going to let you register multiple units in a single family home, I don't, that'll be an interesting so The question is the definition of the unit, I yeah. guess. Because, I mean, I can imagine a retired couple that raised four kids in their home and they have three extra bedrooms would want to maybe rent out every weekend all three bedrooms if they could. So that would, in fact, pass that threshold of the... Mm -hmm. I'll try to get clarification, but I still think that one, the single family piece would be controlling. Because um, you're not, and again, the goal of this is, are you taking rental stock out of circulation? And nobody could say that that retired person's bedrooms were like lost rental stock, because it's not, you know, so I think that's the, the real key here, um, which is why at the end of the day, the only thing that would be left um, untouched by what, what I'm proposing to implement is that one family scenario. So I don't, I, I think it's more, like the gentleman who came up and said, you know, I have two family, um, and uh, and I'm, you know, it's owner occupied, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, that unit would be considered a unit being taken off the rental market. Um, so I think that I, I don't think it would apply. I can try to get clarification between now and council. Um, it would be good to try and figure out what they do mean by owner occupied or if there is a yeah. separate definition because yeah, there work. are I mean certainly in big cities there are there are plenty of people who will go and stay with their boyfriend or girlfriend and and, and Airbnb their residence um, I mean I've certainly ex you know heard of that so mm -hmm. but to be an owner you have your name has to be on the deed to the property to begin with like to be an owner right. of the property so like you own the property um, and then occupy means you're 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 living in the unit. So but if you spend fifty percent of your time somewhere else and you are Airbnb, that although your maybe your mail goes there, you may be registered to vote there. Yeah. Um, I think so. I'll I'll try to get some clarification on what the tests will be for owner occupied. But this isn't the first area where I mean there are lots of energy programs and other programs right. that only apply if you live in the home. You can't have a vacation home or a vacation rental apply. So there's got to be other state tests for that. So yeah, there's lots of different scenarios. Right. Um, but I think at the end of the day, this was never targeted at a person who's living in a single family home who's just renting you know, a, a back bedroom. Um, because that's not something that was otherwise being made available in the, in the broader rental market. As opposed to a two-family or three-family, or, or or an apartment building, or you know, so or you might own multiple um, two families around the city, and you're renting out you know one more two or more units in, in a combination of those. Right. So, Councilor Nash. Yeah, and I'd like to get clarification around the mother-in-law suite because. It is one of those cases where sometimes the mother-in-law is actually living there, and other times people are actually renting it out as, as a second unit. <laughs> but per our zoning, 
the mother-in-law suite is it's it's considered part of a single family home so it would fit in some ways mm -hmm. under the owner occupied but in other ways it could be okay. a rental unit okay I just I'll, think it's one of the okay. gray area places okay I'll find out if there's any um, if there's any distinction between a mother-in-law apartment um, I mean, if it's not accessory a, apartment, I think. I, I guess so, but <laughs> I get what you're saying. But I'm just saying yeah. an accessory apartment. I mean, I don't know. I mean, we define what accessory units are: right. attached and detached. Right. So this would be an attached accessory unit. Um, I can look into it and see. We're kind of rare, and not a lot of communities even have accessory um, attached accessory. It's very controversial. It's like. And I always laugh because I go to these statewide meetings where they're talking about the new evil zoning changes they're trying to make, those darn smart growth people. They're talking about accessory apartments. I'm like, we've had those for 20 years. Right. Nothing's gone wrong. So um, so I, I, I'll, I'll look and see whether they even envision that as part of this definition. Thank you. I wanted some clarification about the, um, the occupancy periods. Yeah. I, were you talking about um, the tax? Or the community impact. Fees I was just the reading ninety what a, days and the thirty-one days. Short term is not more than thirty-one days. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I was just reading what the definition of occupancy was in the state law, and they define occupancy. They define occupant, um, and then you go down to operator's agent, and then it, it, that I would have thought, okay. Um, owner occupied has got to be next, but then it skipped over to something else. So that's the skipped occupancy over for the owner, not for a guest? It says, it says the use of or possession or the right to the use or possession of a room in a bed and breakfast, hotel, lodging, ho house, or motel designed and normally used for sleeping and living purposes for a period of not more than 90 consecutive calendar days. But see, the irony of that is that if in fact somebody comes, like a professor comes and yeah. he rents a room in your house for a semester that is 92 days, yeah. he's actually a long-term renter and you don't fit into the short-term rental mar market. You're not part of the, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, but you probably wouldn't go through Airbnb. You probably wouldn't do a pre-arranged rental in advance. You probably, you know, that would be, which are some of the other triggers for what defines a short-term rental when you read the agreement. You know, so you have to meet all of those pieces well it's just they together. define short-term rental very specifically and so I don't know whether you were hosting a professor on sabbatical for a semester you know I, I it doesn't seem um, uh, I'm not <coughs> sure because to be an operator you've got to um, yeah it's got it's got different uh, definitions but it seems like it's not envisioning that but Again, that's a question we can ask. And what was the difference between the 90 days and the 30 Yeah, it days? just it talked about occupancy, and it said that um, uh, nine, it's 90 calendar days for 90 consecutive. If you're not staying, uh, you know, because there's also like these residence inns, you know, like you can you can rent for longer period that are set up for they have a kitchen, they have more sanitary. I think that's sort of what they may be talking about in here, and this may have actually predated. Uh, this most likely predated this Airbnb oh. law. Then they just added a definition for short-term rental. So they go on to say, right or to use or possession of a room in a short-term rental, normally used for sleeping and living purposes for a period of not more than 31 consecutive calendar days, um, regardless of whether use and possession is a lessee, tenant, guest, or licensee. Um, uh, it just says, you know, but you get to use the furniture, et cetera. So I, I'm not really sure why they have that in there, um, but I don't really think it matters because the bottom line is if you're signing up for one of these short-term rental uh, systems and you're, you know, uh, I think you, you'd still fall under the law. Um, I don't know who would Airbnb for, do people Airbnb for like six months? Well, that's, I'm wondering that's if those, those, Corporations even allow you to. Okay, he says there's a sabbatical rental. So that cuts right. into like more traditional like month to month renting that you would do with for landlord situation. That yeah. It doesn't get into the problems that short term rentals cause of as acting as hotels um, when you're doing it for months. Yeah. 
Hmm. Yeah, this definitely opens up a whole lot of questions, more questions than answers. So. so the other question I have, it's not necessarily for you, it's more a discussion point, and maybe this is just a red herring, I'm not quite sure, is um, people who are renting, they have a second apartment or something like that in Northampton, I know a few of these kinds of situations, and they rent them through alumni associations or and they do them as short-term rentals, but they're not using one of these known entities like VRBO or Airbnb. Would the concept be that we would actually look look for those in some way to kind of target them, or? I mean, with any of these things, you would you would enact. You know, there's the law that says if they're doing this short-term rentals, whether whatever platform they're doing it through. Yeah. that they're supposed to register. Um, and so my suspicion would be it would be complaint driven. You know, if there was some issue that, that came to the fore and it was discovered that somebody's doing a short-term rental, running a short-term rental and they're not, you know, somebody complains that their credit card got stolen or whatever it is, their car got broken into, it, it'll probably trigger then, wait a minute, are you even a registered short-term rental? Or a neighbor, yeah. perhaps, or something. I, yeah, I don't see, or a rival, not a rival, but a, a somebody who is an Airbnb who's who's playing by the rules. Um, so again, I, we're not going to send out people to knock on everyone's doors and look for um, Airbnb. I and mean, I think the biggest piece is going to be, um, you know, the convenience of using these platforms is what makes the this possible in the economy. Um, like, you know, same way you can go sign up for Uber and put a sticker in your car and suddenly you're an Uber driver or whatever, you know, so it's like that's the convenience factor. Um, so I think that's, I'm not sure how many, I'm, I'm sure there are people who do it without outside of the platform, but I just don't think it'll be as widespread uh, without the ease that Airbnb, you know, they, they hook you up with your rental, they collect the money, they collect the taxes, they deal with the credit card, all of that stuff is taken care of, so. Yeah. And people know where to look for your unit. What's that? People know where to look for your unit, mm -hmm. right? So once you yeah, once if you're on one of those platforms. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. I'm actually not on Airbnb, but I, I, I yeah. So I mean, when, if you're an Airbnb member, and Jim has his an Airbnb rental, you still can't see his exact address until you commit. Until, yeah. And until register you for the property. sort of sign the contract. Yeah. Then you get yeah. the actual address. Right? To Grandma Nash's best uh, <laughs> bedroom. <laughs> That's the mother of oh, Grandma Nash. <laughs> uh, the Lewis. 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 The Lewis. Yeah, your Grandma Lewis. So. <laughs> That's why you went to that. All right, I was getting a little punchy. He might charge his mother-in-law rent for all we know. That's true. <laughs> anyway, too soon. Um, any other questions, comments? Are we ready to vote on this motion? Yes? Yes. All those in favor of a positive recommendation of these two orders together? Aye. Please say aye. Aye. No objections, no abstentions. So that is going forward with a positive recommendation from us. Um, at new business. It has been brought to our attention by Councilman Ash that um, our April meeting is scheduled for Patriots Day. So, we need to pick a new day. Laura had suggested uh, Monday, April 8th at 4 p.m. or April 22nd. I it will not be here on April 22nd, but I could do the 8th. Um, Oh, sorry, I should have said this would be before. If we schedule it before, and then it's possible. But we can do it before. It's possible we might not need to meet it. Um, process of fine, do we also could, oh, you we could schedule it for the 22nd, hoping that Councilor Pitlong will be available that day. Um, and then there will be quorum. I just will not be here. That would be a five if we did that. That would be a five. I think I'm not interfering, but at 6.30 there's a, 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 a
Yeah, and it's also on a start one thing. But it's, it's, it's fine to schedule it for the eighth, and I'll try and work early, but I have to miss part of the meeting. It makes more sense that I want to put the chairman in the room now. Yeah, there was six bedroom. That's too bad. Okay, so shall we go for the eighth at four and hope that if we need to meet, it will be brief? Um, because legislative management. Well, if we have a lot, we can reschedule, right? Yeah, that's true. If it's looking... We could table the whatever is super long. Come up with another one, yes. Sure. Okay? Sounds good. Okay. 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 Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're going with April 8th, 4 p.m. Thank you. Um, that's the only other thing that I have. Does anyone else have any new business? Move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.